Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy, and you're listening to Revive Thoughts. The man now has a new motive to obedience to the law of God. The foundation which the Holy Spirit imparts causes him to view the world and the things of the world in a totally different light. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history and a sermon that they delivered. This sermon will be preached in England in the late 1800s. Normally, it is Troy and Joel, as last week, Joel had to do the episode without me. This week, it's on me to do the episode without Joel. We have been having all kinds of issues. If you guys want to be praying for Revive Thoughts to get things settled, um, getting me getting back to Indonesia has been quite a headache uh, and just a lot of different things between bad internet, bad timing, very full schedules, but the Lord has been very good to us. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who are out there who... Uh, we we have seen so many different people, even though we got to take a month off, uh, we got to actually visit some people who listened to the show. I got to speak at someone's church who we knew from the show um, and was a listener, and it was really amazing. And so I I love being able to do what we do here at Revive Thoughts, and it was really cool to be able to meet some of the people uh, who reached out to us and said, hey, we would love to have you speak at our church or share with us. And also, for those of you who reached out that we weren't able to speak at your church, we do really appreciate all of you. And it was really, really cool. It was a great summer. Uh, I missed doing Revive Thoughts. so And so it's really good to be back behind the mic and recording once again. So thank you again to all of you who supported us. And thank you for all of you who have joined our Following the Frasier page um, over the past couple months or just in any way has been uh, with us in this journey. It's been really, really amazing. All the different things that God has been allowing us to do. Now we have some positive responses to Revive Thoughts. This week I have a review from Pat1689. I really enjoy this podcast, which I've listened to for at least a year. They discuss sometimes obscure Jesus followers, which are often are overlooked in many Christian history books. Hearing the actual sermons read is especially appreciated. Thank you for that. We really appreciate that. Uh, I believe uh, also we may have read a review recently by someone else with the the 1689 at the end of their Apple podcast review. They're not the same person though. So if you go back, you'll see that was one. This is someone else. Uh, we also got a very long email from a person listening to the show, Ethan Goforth. It was really cool to hear from you and just the way that our show has been apparently edifying you and encouraging you uh, while you're just doing different things at work and stuff like that. So that's just been really um, a blessing to see that the show is just being used in your life. And thank you so much for listening. And I uh, also want to thank a Patreon listener. We have, uh, I think it's Tavis James Delaney. So thank you for joining us on Patreon. If you're listening to us and you're on Patreon, you get access to all the deep dives, including the Joan of Arc, uh, the Salem Witch Trials, and uh, the First Crusade, which are awesome. We haven't put those out for the public. We have given you, if you're listening, the access to the London Fire and Ethiopia, but we still have some deep dives in the vault. So you have to join Patreon to get to those. All right. With no further ado, let's jump into the story of David Livingston. Now, we have done episodes on David Livingston before. We have actually promised our last one would be the last episode we did with uh, David Livingston. Uh, He doesn't have that many speeches. He spent 99% of his time overseas doing mission work, but he did have one more speech that we discovered. It's pretty short. Um, and it was turned into a pamphlet on the Holy Spirit and talks about the kind of character of God's really cool. And this is, I really think, the last time we can have David Livingston on our show. But I will take any opportunity I can to share about this amazing man. If you have not listened to our other episodes, it is something I highly recommend you go do. They're called Heart of Africa is one of them. And then the other one that we did was a special crossover episode uh, for with Martyrs and Missionaries. So my wife and I talked about David Livingston together. And it's just a really, really cool episode. So go check those out. But after you listen to this one. Now, one of the first things about Livingston that you will always see if you're hearing about him, is that he grew up poor. He was born in 1813 in Scotland, and he did. He grew up incredibly poor. His mother descended from a group of militant Presbyterians, and faith was extremely important just to their family in general. And so that was kind of a part of his lifestyle as he grew up. But imagine growing up on the floor, on the top floor of a tenement building. I mean, just on the top floor of a building that back in those days didn't get air conditioning, right? Like how hot that would be up there. And then also 
Imagine you grew up with seven siblings and your mom and dad in a single room, and you live across the street from the cotton factory. You're not living in the good side of town. And that was the, the world that David Livingston lived in for his entire childhood. And at 10 years old, he would begin working at the cotton mill factory. I did some research on what were cotton mills like in Scotland at the time, because I think it's important we realize how bad they were, because they were bad. Often they would employ women and children at far higher rates than other places. Just 30, so, 30 or so years before Livingston started working at the factory, his hometown had a huge strike that led to sold, and they were asking, they were saying, give us better wages, give us better lives. And the soldiers fired on the crowd and killed them, and they did not get any better wages or better lives. So things are so bad, people were literally like, hey, we need some, you know, we need a little more money. This is money. This is really hard. And the answer was no. Uh, Livingston was not alone. Some factory, as a child worker, some factories had two thirds of them would be workers. Oftentimes they would have children start as young as four. My son is four. And these little four-year-olds would grab pieces of things that fell off the factory floor all day long and collect them. And they'd have to get squeezed between the machines to get them. It's hard to imagine a four-year-old working. So in comparison, Livingston starting at 10, I guess that's a little old compared to some of the workers he was working with. Less than two decades before Livingston had started working, a law had been passed in Scotland that banned children working longer than 12-hour days. Most Adults don't even work a 12-hour day, right? And we have children as young as four working 12 hours a day. And often, and if it basically, even though it passed, it wasn't being followed in any of the factories. The average child is working 14 to 16-hour days. And if they were caught sleeping, they would be beaten. Can you imagine if you fell asleep at work and your boss caught you and beat you? And could you imagine being a child and that happening to you? I mean, it's just... So hard to picture growing up in these conditions. I think for many of us, it would be a nightmare. Yet, for Livingston, it was only the beginning. Because after he finished work, he would then go every day to a place called mill school, where he would mill school, get it for the, the kids who are at the mill. Uh, and he would work, he would go from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. He had to pay to go, and he would pay to learn and to get an education on the side of his factory work. And then with his very first check that he made, he took some of the wages and bought a Latin grammar book because he believed he needed to know it. And for me, I just think that's incredible. I mean, just a 10-year-old buying a Latin grammar book with his, weight, with his meager wages that he's using to help support his family while he's taking school on the side. I don't know how he didn't collapse from pure exhaustion. For as just an aside, maybe you're listening to this and you're younger. I'm not, you might not be 10 like uh, David Livingston, but I know we have families that listen to you. You might be a younger listener and you might be working right now while you're listening to this and you might be, or you might be driving to and from work. That was when I used to listen to a lot of my podcasts before I moved to Indonesia. Um, or you might be listening while working out, but you're somewhere in your life and you may be wondering, I'm not sure what God asked for me. I feel like I'm just kind of grinding away right now. I feel like I'm really at the beginning of things, and I don't see the future of where all this is headed. And you're trying to figure out what is this life that God is driving you on because it just doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. So many of our show, of our show, the guys on our the Revive Thoughts, were like you. Livingston is one example where he was working and grinding away, and he probably didn't know at 10, 12, 14 how God was going to use these experiences. And yet, they were pivotal to Livingston, being who he would end up being. Another example, I think it was J.C. Ryle. He worked for 10 years, and he would work very hard, basically a single dad because his wife died, and he would copy down all of his sermons on an old printing press and have them ready, but he never actually got to use them for over 10 years. And he had to be wondering, is God ever going to use this? I think it's a common thing. I think there's some of you going through the same thing where you're working hard, you're quietly unknown in the world, you're not where you want to be, you're not even sure if you're ever going to get where you're trying to go, and you're just wondering, why does God have you in that place? And I will say, just keep at it. Stay at that hard work. Hold on to what you're doing. Stay at the plow, because so many others were in your shoes once, and they were the people who changed world history. So don't you know? be faithful where you're at, because you never know where the Lord will take you. Now, Livingston eventually earned enough money to get accepted to a medical school, but even then it wasn't all easy. He'd work part of the year at the mill, save that money, and then he'd go to the medical school and he'd pay it off until he'd take some classes and he'd pass and he kind of did that back and forth for a few years. Eventually, he did graduate. 
And he felt like the Lord was sending him and calling him to go, not become a doctor and buy a nice house and live a good life, but to go and join the London Missionary Society. He felt God calling him to be a missionary overseas, a specifically a doctor one. Now, specifically, he thought the Lord was calling him to missions in China. But a war between Britain and China was the opium war was keeping him from going. At the time, they were not allowed to send missionaries to China. And he waited for years, kind of like, where's my opportunity? Where's my opportunity? But it just never came. But eventually, he gave up and said, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to China. And so he continued his working. He studied Greek on the side. He studied theology. He studied medicine. And he was kind of going along until he heard a famous speech from a famous missionary from Scotland, like himself, who had gone to Africa. And he felt called to go and serve in Africa, Robert Moffat. Robert Moffat would end up being, by the way, the father of Livingston's future wife. The Livingston in his time in Africa is wildly famous. And like I said, we've done two episodes on this. We've covered this a bit. I don't want to go into all the details of his journeys. They are the things of legend. So if you've not heard about what he did, it, you should. It's absolutely wild. Go and listen to those episodes. He would cross deserts that had never been crossed before by Europeans. He would discover what is today called Victoria Falls. He discovered lakes, tribes, people groups. And he did it all differently than those who had come before him. Up until him, him when explorers went into areas like this, they took big, large groups with them, armed to the teeth, full of supplies so they wouldn't die. However, Livingston did it different. He would take small groups. He would take little amounts of weapons so they wouldn't be seen as an army passing through, but they would be seen as a small band of explorers moving quickly. And he would barter with the natives so that he was able to get the supplies that he needed as he went. If you want an example of what the big groups look like, go and listen to Elise's episodes on Henry M. Stanley going through Africa. Henry M. Stanley, by the way, was saved directly by his contact with David Livingston and is famous for the line, when he found uh, David Livingston, Dr. Livingston, I presume, which people say is probably not true, regardless of whether it is or not, though. Henry M. Stanley was profoundly impacted, but when he would go and do his missions, he would go with these big, large caravans. And I really insist, if you have not listened to Elisa's Martyrs and Missionaries on the Henry M. Stanley story, put that in your download queue right behind the other David Livingston episodes, because it is a wild, tragic, but also good story. Despite all this, some people consider Livingston's work in Africa as a failure. If you Google Livingston today, your average kind of Christian blogger or YouTuber or whatever, we'll talk about how he kind of failed as a missionary and what he did wrong and how he only really brought one person to Christ. And even the one person he brought to Christ, it's questionable how great a convert he was. And I think it's so fitting that this last sermon and speech by David Livingston covers the Holy Spirit. Because I do believe that the Holy Spirit was using Livingston in some great and powerful ways to make moves in Africa. And I'd like to point to three different areas that you could really say, if it were not for Livingston paving the path, Christians would not have been able to do what they did for future generations. I suppose I kind of look at Livingston's success as he didn't really have a lot of success at bringing people to Christ. It's true. He didn't convert his millions. He's not a George Whitfield or someone like that. But he set up the infrastructure that was needed for Africa to have huge missionary success in the future. What do I mean by that? Well, first, let's remember that when Livingston went, what was he going to do? He went to be a doctor. Remember, he studied medicine at the cotton mill all that time, grinding away at his life so that he knew the medicine that would help him succeed in Africa. He is responsible for discovering, quite painfully, the cures and causes of many diseases. And the reason is, is because he and the explorers that went with him would often have these diseases. I think I read that he had malaria alone something like 27 times. Now, when you go through things like that, you learn a lot about it. Now, one of the reasons he did well with malaria is because he studied how did the people in Africa treat it when it showed up? And he carefully paid attention. And because he had the medical knowledge to do it, he was able to figure out what are they using and what works and what doesn't. And he became one of the first people in history to identify quinine as one of the things needed. Years later, people using his notes, in fact, a relative of his, not a super close one, but a relative of his, was specifically the man who cured malaria. But it was because of what he learned from 
Livingston. On top of that, he was specifically one of the first people to scientifically note a connection between mosquitoes and malaria. But it wasn't just malaria that he helped bring a cure to. He also noted the connection between tick bites and various diseases, specifically one called sleeping fever. He also noticed the causes of dysentery that were so common. He also helped notice the causes and cures for typhoid and the type of pneumonia that was common in Africa as well. He was also considered one of the first people to figure out that a disease called relapsing fever was called by the tsetse fly. This was a very dangerous disease. It was sometimes called, I believe, the sleeping disease. And it is responsible for killing one third of Ugandans in the 20th century. Imagine for a second that one in three people in your country died from one disease. Well, he was one of the people who, in his medical notes, writing these notes and publishing them and getting them out there because he was so famous as a missionary explorer, his notes were very fundamental in curing that disease. That doctoral knowledge that he had learned at the London, uh, learned back in his days at the cotton mill, were able to help pave the way for people learning to survive against these diseases and figure out their causes. Not only that, but it wasn't just him going alone. He took a doctor with him whose name was John Kirk on one of his exploration adventures. And John Kirk's notes were also pivotal in bringing an end to some of these diseases. Kirk, and Ma keep this man in mind, by the way, because we'll talk about him a little bit later, but it's not just Livingston's notes. If Livingston hadn't gone, Kirk wouldn't have gone either. And he was also fundamental in bringing health and doctor work to Africa. So the first point to note, Livingston was pivotal to ending the diseases that killed Africans and killed anybody who tried to visit and bring the gospel to Africa by figuring out what cures were available, by figuring out what the people on the land were using, and by figuring out the sources of these, of these diseases, he was able to move science and medicine ahead by a lot. In fact, Scotland had many very famous doctors about the next 20 or 30 years after Livingston's life. Some people call this the golden age of medical discovery. And many of these doctors, in fact, all of these doctors were inspired by what they learned from Livingston. So think of just how many lives that impacted. Number two, Livingston was pivotal in ending the slave trade. And he is well known as an abolitionist who fought ferociously against slavery in Africa, even being shot at at times by the slave traders. Although Britain had outlawed slavery years ago, the Portuguese were still trading in humans across Africa. And even though it was illegal and many governments frowned on it, they looked the other way. Livingston would write about these issues. He'd sell these books to people. He'd go to crowds to speak about it. And he told the British people what was going on. He would help fund treaties and bring different tribes and groups together so they could fend for themselves. Or they could work out trade arrangements with the Portugal that would officially end it there. Not only did he help bring an end to slavery in different parts of Africa himself, but the year that Livingston died, John Kirk, that same doctor from before, worked a treaty out between Portugal and East Africa, ending the slave trade in that part of Africa. Henry M. Stanley, the guy that interacted with David Livingston, came to Christ, came back to Africa, and would later on bring an end to the slave trade in Central Africa, the last place that slavery still existed. Had it not been for Livingston, pushing that part of his life, these other men may not have had these opportunities to bring it about. Thus, we see that Livingston directly helped bring it into the slave trade. And why was that important? Europeans were a part of the slave trade, but by ending it, it gave them trust in the eyes of people of Africa. No longer were Europeans seen as a source of slavery and oppression. Because of Livingston and others like him, they started to become seen as sources of hope education, medicine, and sources of something greater, the great light that we see in Jesus Christ. Had it not been for Livingston's hard work in this area, the slavery trade might not have been ended, and that stain might have continued to hold people back from knowing Christ. Livingston, by the way, is deeply honored in many places in Africa to this day due to his work in this area. And lastly, Livingston's legacy inspired many people back home Mary Slessor, who is a huge impact on missions in the North of Africa that my wife, Elise, has done an episode on. If you haven't listened to it, go do so. Put it on the queue right behind him, Henry M. Stanley and David Livingston episodes. All right. 
would not have gone. She said she was specifically inspired that when Livingston died, she said, wait, who's going to go to Africa? I'll go. Someone has to go take his place. Henry M. Stanley, huge impact on the middle of Africa, cannot be understated how much he did. The Livingston Inland Mission, which would eventually get moved into another organization, was founded because of, yes, you guessed it, Livingston, missionaries who after he died, they said, we got to go and do what he was doing. And not only that, but the man who founded the Africa Inland Mission, a man named Peter Cameron Scott, specifically cited the moment he stood at Livingston's tomb and read the inscription about going to Africa and said, I need to go and app to Africa. Those are just some of the famous names of people. So many people were impacted by the life that Livingston lived. Even though Livingston himself did not bring that many people to Christ, he helped be the fire that lit the, that lit the fires of many others that did go and take his place. Had he not lived, had he not gone, would so many people have stepped up to the call to go to Africa? All of this from a man who was once a child cotton mill worker. When he was learning medicine, in between his shifts at the cotton mill, when he was learning grammar as a child, working at a cotton mill 14 hours a day, trying not to fall asleep so he didn't get beaten by the boss, he had no idea that that would be the tool that would lead him to medicine. He had no idea that that medicine he was learning would eventually lead to the cures of so many diseases that are cured today. He was directly responsible for how many millions of people lived and are still alive because of the work that he set forth. By doing that, he allowed the conditions for not only many people in Africa to survive diseases they weren't, but he also created the conditions for missionaries to go into Africa who didn't die as soon as they got there, as it was so common to do beforehand. How many people heard the gospel because their missionary survived malaria, survived sleeping disease, survived uh, dysentery, survived all these different things that were going on from parasites to ticks to mosquitoes. He was keeping track of all of it. And these people lived and were able to share the gospel of Christ. But why did they go? Well, they went because they were inspired by Livingston to go. And as more people came and went, more organizations were formed, and they were all able to make inroads in the places that missionaries hadn't. And finally, why did they listen? Why did the African people, who had so long been treated badly by the Europeans, listen? Because it was the Europeans and men like Livingston who helped blaze the path and bring down slavery and free so many of them and then bring them the cures to the diseases that had so long ailed their tribes while they told them about a better way in Christ. All these things were infrastructure that the Holy Spirit used Livingston to set up. So it's true. Livingston didn't bring many people directly to Christ. But to say that God did not use Livingston to open the door to Africa and set up great things there would be absolutely false. I think when we look at Livingston's life, what we should see is that he was a very successful person and opening that door and paving a way and inspiring people to go and helping them to be trustworthy to listen to and helping the way to be made so that so many others could come to Christ. We are talking about the divinity of the Holy Spirit and his operation on the human heart. The first question, which should grab the attention of every honest seeker of the truth in coming to the Bible, should be, is this the word of God? Let him consider that it completely is, and that every statement contained within the book must be received with perfect confidence, even if it may not match with what he should have expected to find in a revelation of the will of God. And every law within it must be received with ready obedience, even if it may not agree with his own preconceived ideas of right and wrong. And even though he cannot understand its mysteries or explain them within the limited grasp of his own logic and reasoning, all must be received on the grounds of the divine testimony. The word must be relied on with full confidence. The doctrine I am going to work through is one of the mysteries of the Bible. It is known from no other proof except what is deductible from that source. Because of the imperfections of our nature and our limited abilities, we cannot fully understand the existence of the Trinity. But even if it cannot be understood fully, 
what can be understood can be taught to an ordinary mind when we ground our faith in those things which are above our reason, when we ground our faith in divine faithfulness. The terms employed in Scripture concerning the Holy Spirit clearly convey to us the ideas of personality and divinity. He is described as being sent, as teaching. Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, John fourteen twenty six, And Christ said, he will testify of me, John fifteen twenty six, As descending like a dove, Matthew three sixteen, As searching, striving, dwelling in. The bodies of believers are said to be the temples of the Holy Spirit. The same attributes being ascribed and homage paid to the Father and Son indicates his divinity. He is spoken of in the same terms as God. For Peter said, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but God. Holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. He spoke by the mouth of David and by Isaiah the prophet. Now all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And God spoke in various times and divine manners. In times past, for the fathers, by the prophets. He is the instrument in the new creation, and none can create but deity. The same worship as we see. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. These passages prove the Holy Spirit to be a divine person. Otherwise, we must admit the Bible contains superfluous material. Some of these passages have no meaning other than to prove the Holy Spirit's deity. The united testimony of both scripture and experience prove man to be a sinful, guilty, and polluted creature. His heart is at enmity with God, and this leads him to be in direct opposition to the Holy Feast and good law of God. His loves are corrupted, his understandings darkened, and his will perverted. The Bible treats him as a moral and accountable agent. Salvation is freely offered to him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Faith in the work of Jesus Christ is all that is required to shield him from everlasting punishment. Yet, he will not believe it unless the Holy Spirit exerts his influence over his will by convincing him of sin. The Holy Spirit shows him the deceitfulness and desperate wickedness of his own heart and the folly and danger of living in sin. The Holy Spirit exhibits to his view the beauty of holiness. He shows him the perfect consistency of the plan of mercy through Christ with the claims of justice. How the plan of mercy completely adapts the heart to all his wants and displays to all the love of Christ in his heart. The man now has a new motive to obedience to the law of God. The foundation which the Holy Spirit imparts causes him to view the world and the things of the world in a totally different light than formerly. The change is so great and wonderful that he is then called the new creation, the new birth. While it is the fact that the operation of the Holy Spirit is absolutely required in this change, yet man is still treated as a moral an accountable agent throughout. The Holy Spirit does not communicate any new abilities to the soul. For the sinner, as as capable of believing, loving, rejoicing, hating, etc., in a state of nature as in a state of grace. And though he is described as naturally unable to love and serve God, yet the reason lies in the fact that he will not. His inability is moral, not physical. Our Lord says, you will not come to me that you might have life. And on this principle, I apprehend those who are condemned, who choose to reject this salvation. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Some object to this view of the subject because they find such declarations in scripture as these. No man can come to me except the Father who has sent me to draw him. Without me, you can do nothing. These expressions may be explained by a similar one relating to a different thing. 
It is said the brethren of Joseph could not speak peacefully to him. Now everyone knows there is no physical impossibility existing here. They were quite capable of it had they been so inclined. The gospel is likewise addressed to the will. Whosoever will let him come and take the water of life freely. There is nothing blocking the way of the sinner obtaining salvation except his own moral depravity. The Holy Spirit is promised to all who ask it. If you, then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Hear the air of those who think, because his influence is essential to the right reception of the truth into the heart, they are justified in continuing in sin as if they are waiting for an effect to be produced within them on the grounds of which they imagine they will be justified before God, and so they continue to reject Christ and resist his Spirit. The Spirit is the grand agent in the sinner's sanctification, though by faith in Christ he is justified in the sight of God. Yet the seeds of depravity still remain. The power of sin is broken but its pollution still exists. The believer is commanded to strive against sin, to work out his salvation from its pollution. He is commanded as if he could do it all himself, and at the same time to trust to the Holy Spirit as if he could do nothing. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Through sanctification of the Spirit, and belief of the truth, the sinner is saved from all sin and pollution and made ready for the inheritance of the saints in light. Livingston is an amazing person, and I really respect him. I'm going to be honest with you. It's a little bit bittersweet and a little bit sad to me that this really is the last time we can cover David Livingston on this show. I will say that being able to bring some of his speeches back to life, are it really is truly one of the greatest pleasures of doing this show. It's one of the reasons I like this show so much. I love doing Revive Thoughts because I love learning more and hearing about these great people that came before. I hope that you too are inspired by them and that they encourage you, and that the lives they lived, the things they suffered, will help you to grow in your walk with God. I know that when I hear about a guy like David Livingston having malaria 27 times, it really encourages me to step it up and to uh, follow God a little bit harder and complain maybe a little bit less about the life that I'm living. And it also helps me to realize that I don't know how God will use my life into eternity. I'm sure that when Livingston was learning grammar at 11 years old at the cotton mill, he didn't know the impact he would have on this world either. And yet, he was used greatly by God. And I think so often we underestimate how greatly God can use us when we are fully available to him. This episode of Revive Thoughts was brought to you by Patrick Studebaker. Thank you to Patrick for reading this episode. Patrick is a great friend of the podcast. He has read many sermons for us. He is also a great friend in general and just a very good man. And so we really appreciate him. If you would like to hear more of Patrick, we encourage you to go listen to the many episodes of Revive Thoughts he has done. I believe he's been Gregory of Nazianzas. I believe he's been uh, Basil. He's been many of the old people that we've had on the show. He's been other people as well. But also he has a podcast, Cage of the Cross podcast. It is a wonderful podcast that covers apologetics and makes uh, apologetics accessible you should definitely go listen to it and check out his show uh, and give him some support tell him hey we heard you from Revive Thoughts and uh, we think what you do is great if you enjoyed this episode of Revive Thoughts if you enjoyed listening to David Livingston you have several episodes I've told you to listen to you should be listening to David Livingston part one and two after this you should also be listening to Henry M. Stanley on Martyrs and Missionaries and you should be listening to Mary Slessor after that I think what I would say today is if you have not listened to Martyrs and Missionaries by my wife, I highly encourage you go subscribe to her show. If you enjoy stories like Livingston's, you're like, I like these missionary stories. I think they're pretty cool. Well, Revive Studios has a podcast for you called Martyrs and Missionaries, where they talk about the stories of martyrs and or missionaries. And we had somebody recently tell us, oh, I, I don't listen to Martyrs and Missionaries because I don't want to be sad. Well, not every episode is a person get martyred. They're martyr and missionaries. So some of them are just missionaries. However, I promise you, 
that they some of them will honestly make you sad. We had a person over the summer tell us they're like, I don't want to. I like listen to podcasts while I mow the lawn. I don't want to be crying out in the yard. Look, I can't promise you won't cry, but I can promise you will hear some incredible, encouraging, amazing episodes of wonderful people who live lives that so challenge us today and will so challenge you and stretch you and make you realize you can do way more things that you're doing for God. And they will just, I think, deeply encourage you to grow. So if you enjoyed listening to Livingston, please go check out Martyrs and Missionaries. It is a wonderful show that tells just amazing stories. This is Troy, and this is Revive Thoughts.